just to define some terms, I would describe fulfillment as a state of having your set of basic human needs met. Creativity and conviviality and physical health and nutrition and sexuality. If you don't get them, you don't survive very well. And so if we don't have them, we feel uh, some kind of adjutant. And if we do have them, then we feel fulfilled. Then I would define a next term, which is well-being. And well-being is both the sense and the reality of being able to achieve fulfillment in a consistent, sustainable way. Well-being is what we're actually trying to accomplish. What we mean by jobs, I believe, and this is not perfect, but it's good enough to work with, is the, the system that we use to provision individual well-being in a fashion that is generative of collective well-being. Now, to make that concrete, it's I work to be able to get the things that I think I need to be able to live well. By so doing, I contribute my skills and energy to some collective from which you are able to draw for your particular individual well-being, provided that you also contribute your skills back to this commons. And that's what we're trying, that's what this sub-function is, okay? Now, somewhere around the 1600s, we hit upon an approach to try to do a good job at that, okay? And it worked really well, right? So the, the neoliberal capitalist system, in fact, substantially increased the well-being of people around the world uh, compared to where it was before. The notion that there, what is it, there is no better system, that was probably true. I don't know, but it probably was true. Uh, that's no longer the case. Right? So we no longer in a circumstance where we have to use a system that we know is designed to create winners and losers because we're in a circumstance where simultaneously we can create a system where there are no losers and we must. The constant process of competition and development and struggle that was implicit in the genius of the previous system has led us to where we are right now. That doesn't work anymore. There's lots of good reasons to explain why it can't possibly work anymore. I'd be uh, reference a, a, a gentleman named Joseph Tainter and the collapse of complex societies as a categorical explanation for precisely why it can't work anymore. Uh, but we can be more simple. Um, you know, our system has provided a Western level of standard of living for about 40% of the population. The other 60% of the population is living on around a dollar a day. So if they want to move up to even $10 a day, guess what happens to all of our ecosystems? Right? So we, we can draw lots of reasons why the current way of doing things can't continue. Um, okay, so let's deconstruct that. What are we trying to accomplish? Well, in, as we discussed with jobs, what we're trying to accomplish is some system whereby we can provision individual well-being in a fashion which is generative of our collective well-being. Right? So that you can figure out a way to live the best life that you can while simultaneously not inhibiting my ability to do that or anybody else's ability to do that. In fact, ideally, in a way that causes us to all level up. The short answer is to take into account some really powerful fundamental of what happened in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, up from the beginning of life, up until the 1960s and 70s, the, the primary problem was the uh, extraction and distribution of fundamentally scarce or fundamentally rivalrous depletable goods. The kinds of things that if I have them, you can't have them. And if I've used them, they're gone forever. So we know that information is the sort of thing that, that is not rivalrous in nature. Once I've invented calculus, I can just give you calculus and you basically get it for free and then you can build something on top of it. So you get this, -ah! right? This what we've seen in the past you know, 100 years. I can try to make it feel rivalrous by using patent and copyright and shit like that. And the reason why we treat information as a rivalrous good is because we have an economic and legal model that can deal with rivalrous goods they can't deal with the non rivalrous goods. What we're seeing is that um, there is clearly a generalized move in, within the existing economy towards organizational structures that are more affordant to non rivalrous generativity. The movement from, say, the industrial machine model, where laborers engaged in mindless repetitive tasks, all the way through, say, Hewlett Packard and Yahoo to Google is in fact a movement of the progressive discovery of the productivity, the generativity, of increasingly creating things that are in alignment with non-rivalrous techniques. The old model was one that had winners and losers. I call that the carrot and stick model. The carrot and stick model is if you play the game well and you, you know, give the best value, you give, put all your work into it, then you'll get rewarded heavily. And if you don't, you'll get punished. Right? Now, 
in a time frame where we didn't actually have enough rivalrous goods to go around, so somebody was gonna go without. Then that was both a necess necessity, who was gonna go without? Well, at least we're gonna pick the ones who didn't contribute the most, ideally. Obviously, never actually worked that way, but ideally. And also, it turns out that if I punish you for not contributing and reward you for contributing, I get more contributions, so more of us get more stuff. Okay, that's the old model. It turns out that that model is actually inhibitory to the kinds of things that are non-rivalrous. And so creativity isn't just not motivated by carrots and sticks, it's actually destroyed by carrots and sticks. The things that enable creativity are mastery, meaning, and autonomy. Provision circumstances in such a way that you have the capacity to achieve autonomy, mastery, and a sense of meaning, which is gonna be personal and collective because that's the way human beings are wired. Now, if that's the case, what we see is that that is in fact optimal for, doing, for generating non-rivalrous goods. Now, this is very optimistic. Because what that means is that these things are starting to get all into alignment. The things that are necessary for human beings to achieve fulfillment turn out to be precisely the sorts of things that maximize our generation of non-rivalrous phenomena. It turns out that they also maximize our ability to coordinate with each other. Coordinating with each other generates an increase in the production of non-rivalrous phenomena. We know that non-rivalrous phenomena have this exponential growth rate, and that each time we get a level up, we dramatically increase our capacity to provision the rivalrous goods that are at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. So we get this nice feedback loop that if we shift into increasingly non-rivalrous modes, then we get increasing escape velocity where we're constantly rewarded for getting better and better at detaching ourselves from a commoditized environment and better and better at attaching ourselves to a well-being economy.